Musical. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Writer Mother Monster. I'm your host, Laura Ehrlich, and our guest today is Stephanie Burt. Before I introduce Stephanie, thank you all, as always, for tuning in. And please chat with us during the interview. We'll be able to see your comments in the comments section, and we'll weave them into the conversation. Uh, and if you enjoy the episode, please become a patron or patroness to help keep the podcast going. And join me on May 8th for a workshop for writer mothers. Um, we'll share strategies for prioritizing our craft, explore examples, undertake generative writing exercises, and share our prose. Um, you can find that link on writermothermonster.com under classes. Now, I'm excited to introduce Stephanie. Stephanie Burt is a professor of English at Harvard. Her most recent books are After Callimachus, Poems and Translations, and Don't Read Poetry, a book about how to read poems. A chapbook of poems about superheroes and other pop culture figures will appear from Rain Taxi this summer, and another full-length collection of poems from Grey Wolf in late 2022. She's also at work on an anthology of queer and proto-queer poems from before the 20th century with the critic, scholar, and musician Drew Daniel, and as part of a fan collective on a book about the X-Men. Stephanie has two children, ages 11 and 15, and she describes writer motherhood in three words as busy, conflicted, resourceful. Now, please join me in welcoming Stephanie Burt. Hi. Hi, Stephanie. Thank you so much for joining me. Um. Yeah, it's it's an honor. Um, I'm I'm not sure where to go from here, but who is? No, uh, it's part of part of coming out of the. I know many parts of the world are still completely in it, but around here it feels like we're coming out of the pandemic-imposed isolation just a little bit, mm -hmm. and um, I feel like coming back out into the world in the way that a lot of us have tried to engage with it all the time through videos and, and podcasts and things. And on this high quality podcast, it's, it's just, <laughs> it just feels good. Also, I, yeah. I promised you Lockheed. Oh, there, yes. Tell yeah, everyone who this is. And, and Okay, so this, this iteration of Lockheed was crocheted by my friend Fiona, uh, who is uh, very, very good at running tabletop role-playing games, which we can talk about. And I'm, sure. I'm, I'm, I don't know right before I left, so I'm trying to, here we go, there we go, this is Lockheed. <laughs> um, and I own a couple different Lockheeds and different media that people have given me. Uh, Lockheed, as some of you know, is the purple space dragon and uh, loyal companion of Kate Pride, the of the X-Men, uh, the Red Queen of the Hellfire Club, the captain of the Marauder Privateer. Oh, that's and awesome. to figure about whom I have altogether too much to say. It is one of my favorite rabbit holes and we don't have to start there. I also <laughs> want to introduce you to uh, another of our favorite lobbies around here and one who has nothing to do with the X-Men, but quite a lot to do with poetry. This is Octavia Rivets Parsley, who follows the naming convention of the characters in Catherine Valente novels, um, which you may be familiar with her novels. They're really good. The Fairyland books. They're good for oh, reading yeah. aloud to kids. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, Octavia, you know, spills a lot of ink because she's a writer and an octopus mm -hmm. uh, and is um, is a very good aloe parent, really helps with, with parenting. I don't know if she thinks of herself as a mom, but <laughs> she generally gets very quiet on the subject. That's amazing. She has something about, arms to hug with, so. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And if you know something about octopus parenthood, um, you know why she might want to not admit it one way or the other. <laughs> and for anyone who doesn't know about octopus parenthood, now we have homework. Yeah, it's right. actually really disturbing. Octopi really? are super smart and you shouldn't eat them. And I say this as someone who eats cows. Um, <laughs> uh, but they, their relationship to uh, couplehood and reproduction is not one you would want for yourself. Is that right, Octavia? That's right, Octavia. Should we say more thing. about that, or should we look that up on our well, own? They, they, they die. Oh, okay. They generally, generally, motherhood is is the end of their lives. So, <laughs> I know it feels like that for humans sometimes, but uh, for for an octopus, it's sadly literal. 
<laughs> I don't know. It's okay. We can move on. Well, that was a good transition into motherhood. Sure, sure. We've also <laughs> got a second car us. No. Oh, oh my gosh. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, so you have all the mothers lined up and ready to go. Oh, no. Some of them are upstairs. <laughs> also, some of them are pretty clearly non-binary parents. Yeah. Which, which is something that at some point I'm, I I suspect, I mean, I'm a very boringly binary trans girl, but I suspect you've had some non-binary parents on, on the mm -hmm. podcast. Mm -hmm. um, and we can talk about, we can talk about parenting and gender and how there are more than five genders, but we don't want to lead with that either. You've probably got some <laughs> questions to ask me. I'm going to shut no, up now. No, yeah, I, no, I'm, all of those things are perfect. Um, tell me that, let's start with the three words that you use to define writer motherhood. Okay. And those were busy, conflicted, and resourceful. Yeah. So if you want to be a good parent, and especially a, a, a good mom, maybe, um, and do other things, you're busy by definition. Mm -hmm. um, and you're busy even if you have the finances and the local or regional availability of, of people to help you. And many of us don't or didn't. Yeah. Um, we mostly did when our children were very small, but... Now we're finding we need other resources for our, our teen um, and we're learning how to get those. Um, and part of the busyness is realizing that there are a lot of things you can do if you, you learn how to sort what's important to you, what's important to the people you care about and what's actually not important. Mm -hmm. uh, you learn how to sort what is actually your job from what seems like it could be your job, but I'll, I'll, you can delegate or blow it off. Um, and how to sort what's on a deadline from what's not on a deadline. I think a lot of us feel pressure to put our kids first every minute, mm -hmm. which is not in fact helpful, even though putting your kids first every day is generally a good idea. And a lot of us feel so much pressure to do this or that or the other thing, which has a deadline that if it doesn't have a deadline, we don't do it. Mm -hmm. And that means things that are of the highest significance to you personally, and maybe to your family or to, you know, to the other intimates in your life, never get done. And so I've tried to encourage the people around me to figure out what deadlines are fake and which ones are real and to, to find time to do the things that we actually wanna do. But sometimes you just can't. So that's busy. Uh, conflicted should be, I mean, I don't know if it requires explanation. Um, I think anybody who's, I don't even wanna limit it that way. Um, your kids, need you or someone like you constantly hmm. when they're little, except when they're sleeping and then who knows when they'll wake up. <laughs> the more people like you who are around you, the less you have to be on call all the time. Hmm. Um, and even as your kids get older and want more time without you and need more peer time or want more time with adults who aren't parents, there's still the conflict of should I be doing something for my household right now? Should I be doing something for my kid? Am I letting, if you, if you're partnered, am I letting my partner or one of my partners do something I should be doing? And, you know, my history, because of what my work situation has been, and because I was so lucky in the way I was treated professionally early on, has been of sometimes letting my partner or my partners do things that I could have done. And sometimes of doing the thing myself. And there's a conflict around that, however it, it shakes out. Um, and, you know, everyone who's a parent has their own take on that. Um, I, I'm a mom. I am a parent who is a woman uh, and that makes me a mother. And I really like being a mother um, until our, uh, until the early 20 teens, um, people thought I was a dad and that felt really awful because I was, and I didn't understand why it felt so bad until I 
<laughs> figured out why it felt so bad. Um, and uh, for several years, I tried to be a sort of non-binary, gender fluid. What my pronouns are depends on what context you encounter me in person in order not to be, mostly in order not to be super disruptive to the people I was already close to. And that was better than trying to be a guy since I am a woman, but not as good as transitioning and saying, hello, I am I am a girl, my pronouns are she, her, I am a mom. Um, so it took a while. And that means I'm used, to, I, I, I have had some experience not only of being asked, how can you do all these things and still be a mom, but experience of being rewarded for the lesser amount of engagement and the, you know, less than 30% of the household work that people expect dads to do when in couples that are straight appearing. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I have, I have some experience of a lot of kinds of privilege I didn't want, you know, some of which I no longer have and some of which unfortunately are matters of habit. And I think about that a lot. Yeah. Um, and I've been able to get out of things at work by saying, I'm sorry, I have to go parent. I will be right back. My kid needs a sandwich. Mm -hmm. And I love doing that. Uh, I recognize that some of my colleagues who are cis women, um, especially some of my colleagues who are cis women who have less job security than me, can't or won't say, I got to go from this meeting. I'll be back in, in 10 minutes. My kid needs a sandwich because they think it makes them look unserious. Mm -hmm. um, and that's fucked up. And I try to, this, I'm sorry, this is a, no, you can podcast. swear. It's that's totally very fine. Forked, <laughs> it's very forked up. You can um, swear. It's very forked up. Uh, everybody should be able to say, I'll be right back. My kid needs a sandwich. Um, unless you are, uh, you know, a cardiac surgeon in an operating theater. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's pretty much, or, you know, on stage in King Lear, there's pretty much, uh, or on stage in, what's a good example, Cloud Nine, the Kel sure. Churchill play. Uh, I love <laughs> Kel Churchill. There's, there's, there are very, very, very few things that, that it's not worth interrupting if your kid needs a sandwich. And I want to encourage everybody to walk away from their meetings if their kid needs a sandwich. Um, and I try to set an example of that. So that's, that's conflicted. That's yeah. conflicted. And and also the the conflict within parenthood, whether or not you're a, a writer, whether or not you're, you know, making art actively that day, the conflict between doing things for your kid and and letting your kid do the thing, saying, I'm sorry, kid, I'm busy, do the thing yourself. Mm -hmm. That's very, very hard for me. It's especially hard for me because I was raised by a de facto stay-at-home mom. And I think those of us who were raised by parents who did gender in that way, um, maybe have a harder time with some boundaries. Because if your model of how to be a mom is you must give up everything for your kids all the time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's wonderful if, if you're, it's wonderful if your kid is, is one and you have inadequate access to childcare because you have to live that way anyway. But if you're, Kid is is ten. Um. Uh, one second. Um. This is a parenting thing. Um. Uh. Parenting things are encouraged. Yeah. As uh, well as swearing, it's it's totally fine. <laughs> I hear what you're saying though is about um about feeling as though telling your kids to do something for themselves that's conflicting. I also grew up with um, a mother who was there and did everything with me and still helps my my child when she like has to go to the bathroom. And I'm like, she can do it herself, but my mom yeah. goes with her. And, and that's yeah. hard to break. Yeah, yeah. And that's, I was very much, we're trying to work with our older kid who's very, very shy and who's 15 who's wonderful with people he knows, but who really has a hard time coming out of his shell yeah. to the extent that we're, you know, looking at what would be the right school for him now. And we don't have an answer quite yet. Mm -hmm. We have a hypothesis, uh, but it's hard for me to remember when 
to ask him to do more things himself and when that's not an appropriate demand for that particular kid. Yeah. Um, I think that's not only a learned behavior that has to do with stay-at-home moms. I think it's also a, um, I think it's, it, it also, it's a birth order thing. I think f- old, older children and, and oldest children are, are more likely to be, to find themselves being taken care of in that way. Mm-hmm. That can be excessive. And second children, third children are maybe more likely all else being equal to say, you know, I'll just go make my own sandwich. Yeah. Um, I, you know, it's, it's, I don't know how weak a correlation it is, but it's a correlation. And it's certainly our, um, our younger one who's 11, uh, they will make their own sandwich uh, yeah. if necessary. Although honestly, they know how to, especially in pandemic when we were working from home, they know how to order a sandwich. <laughs> and um, they, they will order sandwich after sandwich and then they never eat the crust. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, what can <laughs> you do? But then you get the crust. No, but it's peanut butter sandwich. and jelly. I don't like oh, peanut no. butter and jelly. No, my, no. my younger one, um, uh, we really, um, uh, we like a lot of the same things, but we don't like a lot of the same foods. Mm. Of course, I like foods that I like a lot of weird foods. <laughs> um, so that's, that's conflicted. Uh, and then should we just go to resourceful? Sure. Yeah. So you have to find not just inner resources, but outer resources. You have to know how to ask for help. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I told you I have, um, I've gone from let's not tell people to it's helpful to be open about this. Mm -hmm. Um, we are a poly household. I have multiple partners. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't want to talk about their lives because that's not my story to tell, but I can absolutely really honestly just sort of advocate is the wrong word, but having multiple adults who are close, who are family for some definitions of family and who are just close to our family and who are trustworthy Mm -hmm. is so great. And I'm, and, and who are, have been in our pod during the pandemic and who are just there and Adults who our kids know that one or both of their moms trust absolutely Mm -hmm. and who give our kids resources from personality types to specific kinds of know-how that their pair of moms happens not to have. Um, You know, the, the older I get, the more I see that there are a lot of ways to be a good mom and a lot of ways to be a good parent. And the more I'm a fan of the ways that have more than two adults Mm -hmm. and adults who are not blood relatives, really very there for kids. Yeah. Um, Well, I mean, they used to say it takes a village, right? I mean, it's a cliche phrase, but it's that's. I mean, it's associated, it's associated with a very, fascinating, very flawed human being who's what turned out not to be great at running for office. But the <laughs> exactly. slogan's good. The slogan's exactly right. And that's something that my, my mom likes to say, it takes a village. Mm-hmm. And she would know because she was able, and after, you know, when I was little, she didn't have enough help. And you could tell. Yeah. And I have three, I'm their only daughter. I have three younger brothers. Mm-hmm. And by the time my youngest brother showed up, there was a lot more help available and she was happier. Yeah. You could really tell. It's true. I know. I've been really open with the fact that my parents live 15 or 20 minutes away from us. And the only way I've been able to do anything, including this podcast as we speak is because they're watching her. (laughs) Otherwise I would not be able to do anything. Yeah. Thank you to Laura's parents. (laughs) <laughs> exactly. So yeah, the more adults, you know, blood related, not blood related, where however you can build a village, I think that's so important. But um, 
Tell me a little bit more about yourself um, as a child. We talked about your kids and what they're like. And oh, I was so like? bad at being a child. Oh <laughs> man, I wrote a book about this. It took me a long time to realize that most people in our culture were happier as children than as teenagers because I found the emotional roller coaster and the complicated social life of being a teenager absolutely fascinating, even when it was miserable. Yeah. And um, I mean, of course, people thought it was a boy, so that sucked. Um, <laughs> yeah. But it, at least I was able to you know, hang out with girls and, and be, be part of a set of very geeky social worlds mm -hmm. and you know, have actual, an actual group of people to play role playing games with and you know, be on a quiz bowl team and have a, in a lot of ways, pretty satisfying like geeky teen social life. Um, yeah. as opposed to being a child, which I was terrible at. Um, I am old enough that I think this is, is it's still true in a lot of places, but it's less true than it used to be. The world of childhood was extremely gender segregated. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I didn't, I had very few friends. Uh, my parents didn't know I was a girl because I didn't tell them. Yeah. And I'm old enough that they wouldn't have understood. Yep. Uh, or or would have understood and concluded that I was gay. Um, which, I mean, I am because I date women, <laughs> but that's... It's more complicated. Right, yeah. right, right. No, I think, I really think that they, for a while they thought I was going to grow up to date guys. Um, not that there's anything wrong with that. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, gay here. Uh, but so, uh, my, that's a different rabbit hole, right? Me as a child, um, I loved reading. I loved reading about chemistry and biology. And um, I read a lot of science fiction and fantasy. And I read a lot of comic books. And I didn't read anything realist. I didn't understand what the attraction was of realist fiction. Mm hmm I was probably in my early 20s before I really understood why people read realist fiction. And and uh, now I teach our science fiction class and I read less realist fiction than I did 10 years ago, but I still like George Eliot. George Eliot's great, everybody should <laughs> read George Eliot. Yeah. Um, uh, I, you know, I read a lot. I had a couple friends. I had one friend I was very close to and we just spent all the time that we could playing, creating our own long, intricate narrative involving Star Wars figures, those like little kind of action figures yeah. who we repurposed and renamed in order to make them part of a science fictional future mm -hmm. uh, where they had their own adventures. Um, oh, oh, cool. Okay, thank you to Chris, who is in our Facebook chat. Thank you. Yeah, I don't think that's a question. I think that's just a, that's awesome mm -hmm. to hear. Thank you. Oh, that's um, great, Chris. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, so that was really fun. Uh, his name was Danny, and I think he's a lawyer in Chicago now. But when he became a teenager, he decided that that was he wanted to have teen boy social life with his teen boy friends and drive around and I don't know their cars and do teen boy things. And then we moved away. We moved from Montgomery County, Maryland, to Washington D.C. Uh, and instead of having one friend, I played with Star Wars figures in the closet. Literally, by the way, in the closet. <laughs> literally, uh, there was a closet. Uh, with, um, I made new friends who I could play uh, tabletop role playing games with and uh, do theater tech with and be in high school debate with and and be on a you know quiz bowl show where you you, know, you push the button and the answer is William McKinley. <laughs> and it turns out, you know, I was a terrible high school debater, but I really liked quiz bowl. Um, and uh, <laughs> I, and that's why I know that William McKinley was the 27th president. <laughs> Um, who is calling that? I'm going to get that in case it's my 15 year old. Lark. Okay. Hang That's on. I'm totally going to get fun. that. Okay. <laughs> Hello. Hello. This is not a good time. I'm podcasting right now. I'm so sorry. There was a small, my, my 15 year old LARPs live action role playing. Oh, sure. Where it's amazing. It's, you know, teens and tweens who go to a campsite and sort of have lunch there and hit each other with pretend swords and cast spells. It's the best thing. 
Um, That's amazing. But that might have been LARP coordinated. So anyway, uh, so yeah, I was a, I was terrible at being a child, and um, my parents worried a lot. Uh, I decided when, after I saw some Star Trek, which my father just had on you know, after work, uh, I decided in first grade or so after seeing some Star Trek that um, I had a great deal in common with Mr. Spock and enjoyed pretending to be Mr. Spock, mm -hmm. which apparently is a very common trans girl thing. Really? Um, I can ref oh, oh, yeah. I can oh, refer your articles about it. Yeah, no, yeah. the thing about, thing about Mr. Spock, uh, he's a very good model for trans girls, especially trans girls who are not out to ourselves yet. And for um, people assigned female at birth who don't like performing femininity and therefore for early women in science. And when you look wow. at people writing about their identification with Spock, like if you, if you think of yourself as Spock, you don't have to perform masculinity or femininity. Oh, wow. You can just yeah. perform fascinating. Tell me, um, okay, let's talk more about this. And about let's no, I was the end of I'm um, the end of the previous thread was that yeah, yeah. my really wonderful, kind, thoughtful, normie parents yeah. decided, understandably, although mistakenly, that I thought I was Mr. Spock. Oh. And therefore, that was the beginning of my adventures with child psychiatry. Apparently, I fell down a lot as a child. <laughs> I had a relationship to my body that was not very productive or predictable. And so I was sent to uh the kinds of physical therapy that kids who have CP are given. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't remember that, but I remember years and years and years of adventures with a very well-meaning child psychiatrist who is not around anymore, but who tried very hard and was not the right psychiatrist for me. Yeah. But they knew that, that something was wrong and it was clear if you were interacting with me in as a child in any way, other than can you please give us the right answer on a test or you know what's your favorite Samuel R. Delaney novel or if you go back far enough what's your favorite Isaac Asimov novel that he hasn't you know, held up as well uh, it was clear that there was something weird and, and kind of wrong mm -hmm. and today of course we'd be talking about the autism spectrum yeah. um, and a number of, of my friends who have made not so much through the poetry community as through science fiction communities and comics crit and comics fandom communities are self-diagnosed adults with autism. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the thing. But again, generationally, like I wasn't there, I was just terrible at being a kid. And so I have this fairly optimistic and idealized view of, of teen life. When in fact, for so many people, like you know, ninth grade is the worst and actually, yeah. you know, fifth, fifth and sixth grade were the worst. Yeah. Sorry, long answer. We can talk about Star no. Trek. No, yeah. No. <laughs> Tell me a little bit. So, and maybe Star Trek leads into this, but you mentioned that for the first, however many years of your kid's life, you were um, perceived as a dad. Yeah. And um, did you know, so did you know you wanted kids and did you have a sense of whether you wanted to be a dad or a mom? So I knew that I hated everything about, masculinity for me mm -hmm. it's great for guys like we're raising one uh you know it's great to be a guy if you're a guy i knew that i really disliked that and i knew from you know if if someone had told me at any age at all here's a button push the button and you'll be a girl i would have pushed the button mm -hmm. actual transition when people are already thinking of you as someone with your dead name and your you know it's a little more complicated and i was very scared mm -hmm. I was scared of the disruptions. I was scared that I wasn't trans enough, not trans enough as an entire meme structure. You may have seen it. Uh, <laughs> you know, I was, I, I, I had things, I was scared and I, I thought I was not a good candidate for transition because someone who's, you know, my, I was born in the early seventies, my generation, they told you that you had to be suicidal and also possibly that you had to date men. And it's just a lot of garbage, but yeah. that's what they told you. And so I, I just kind of kept on, trying to be a guy and accumulating, you know, friends and job responsibilities and, and bylines. And I was like, do I have to give all this up? Um, but no, I, I knew that I didn't want to be, I knew that I would, would rather be a girl and therefore, you know, didn't want to be a dad because dads are guys. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, my, my father is a very, very good, generous, helpful person and is very comfortable being a guy. And I, you know, I'm a girl. Um, did I know I wanted kids? The answer to that is I didn't know. Um, I didn't know that I, 
wanted kids or that I was on a, a, a sort of track to have kids until uh, my wife and I got together. And it was clear, she knew that she wanted kids. And mm -hmm. it was clear that if we were gonna stay together, one of the good reasons for being together was we'd be good co-parents, which I hope we are, like, <laughs> this is great. Um, and uh, it was clear that, stay, that, 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 that if we chose each other, that would be me choosing kids. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so I knew I wanted kids as soon as I knew that I wanted to be with her. And I didn't know, cause I, I knew myself enough that I would only be an okay parent with the right, you know, one or more co-parents. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, lo and behold, that's how it turned out. I, I love being a parent. Um, the book that I did when, that came out around the time our younger one was born, when, when Nathan was, was our younger, our older one was preschool age, the book that came out in um, 2013. Um, Nathan was born in 2006 and Cooper was born in 2010, mm -hmm. which means that the book called Belmont was written between 2009 and, and 2012. That's a really rough, sad book. I, I have trouble reading from it now, um, although there's, I'm maybe gonna read a poem from it to you later. Mm -hmm because it was a, it's a book about trying to be an adult and settling down and you're getting a house in the suburbs and I love the town we live in. I think we made the right choice. Um, and about like realizing that you're a normal adult in a lot of ways and a book about having small children mm -hmm. and about the time and energy demands of small children. But it was also a book about trying to be a dad, which sucked because I'm a mom. Yeah. And it's just a really, when I go back and look at it, it's a book that's full of settling, not settling for people, mm -hmm. but settling for roles and, and resignation and trying to cover certain kinds of bitterness with other kinds of happiness. And the happiness was genuine, but the bitterness was, was also genuine because mm -hmm. uh, you can only go so far before your egg cracks. I don't know if that's a, I, I, I don't know if that's a term that uh, our, our wonderful, you know, cis viewers and listeners who have stuck with us this far will know. Yeah. Um, one of the, the, one of the things that's absolutely changed from 2013 when Balmont came out to now is uh, the rise of translate for trans readers and of trans mm -hmm. culture. Yeah. And you know, I hope I have a lot in common with uh, the the moms who are cis women, since the very large majority of moms and of moms who are writers are cis women, right? Mm -hmm. um, but there's also, I feel like now there's something called trans culture and trans lit that um, you know, the the more I suppose bourgeois, less radical part of, yeah. uh, the more assimilationist part of, I suppose, but but that that's there and that I have, I'm able to share experiences both with other trans people and with the large overlapping sets of communities of mothers. That's great, yeah. And, and, with, and with parents who are not women. Um, the next, the next uh, thing I wanna see that I haven't seen yet in terms of writing about being parents is a lot of people who you know, and I, I think, and who I know, are raising kids, right? Whose pronouns are something other than he, him, or she, her. Yep. Um, increasingly, there are parents whose pronouns are something other than he, him, or she, her, and we need to hear those stories. And instead, we have the Argonauts. <laughs> And the Argonauts is a very interesting book, but the Argon this thing this this happened this happened in other it happened in YA in the early two thousands. There's a wave of books that say, "Huh, someone I'm close to has a weird gender. How weird for me." Mm -hmm. And and then and then the next wave is, "Hi, I'm the one with the weird gender. Can I have the microphone, please?" Yeah. Are we there and yet, or are we starting? To get we're there. Writing? We're there with. We're there with other kinds of writing. I don't think we're there with with writing on parenthood yet. 
Mm, yeah. Um, I know parents who are memoirists and essayists, and I know non-binary people who are memoirists and essayists, mm -hmm. but the like, um, I don't know that there's an overlap yet. I'm thinking of a, a close friend who's a close friend whose, whose pronouns are, um, Z Zimzer with an X, uh, who's going to be a parent soon. Mm -hmm. And I hope that in a few years, uh, if that's the kind of writing that, that Z wants to do, that, uh, some editors will get in touch with them. Yeah. But that's the future. Yeah. <laughs> um, How would, well, Tell me a little bit about your experience. You know, if you were to write that parenting book, how well, would I'm that? A, I'm a mom. I'm, I'm. That's not my parenting book. Oh, I'm that's a mom. True. My pronouns yeah, are yeah, she, yeah, her. Yeah. Yep, that's right. Uh, <laughs> I guess what what would you want to see in those parenting books? In those what parenting would you books? want to read in those parenting books? That would be different I would, than I in those parenting books. I would want to see two things. First, I would want to see role models for today's non-binary kids, mm -hmm. some of whom would like to be parents when they grow up. And second, I would like to see models and constructive advice and what works because there's so much completely justified rage out there. Mm -hmm. There's so much very merited wish to just forking dynamite the heteronormative and mononormative and cisnormative and patriarchal institutions and habits and unspoken expectations that have prevented so many of us either from being the parents we want to be or from finding other kinds of you know creative and interpersonal fulfillment. Mm -hmm. There's just so much crap in the way, some of which was always oppressive and some of which served a purpose in a society that no longer exists. And we, we know that. And um, I would, I would like to see more of what's worked. Mm -hmm. I would like to see more honest, imperfect, weirdo, this works for me, but not for you. Here's, here's how this thing happened. Yeah. Um, there are a couple books where a mom and their kid collaborated. Um, I believe Hilda Roz wrote one with her son who transitioned as an adult, I think, mm -hmm. or as a teen. Um, it'd be fun to see more collaboration. I'd like to see more collaboration of various kinds, but I'd like to see, I'd like to see role models like weird, imperfect, like painful, here's how we got here, here's what we could have done differently, but role models, here's some things that worked. Yeah. Um, because rage is valid, but rage is already available. Mm -hmm. and, and here's something else about the literature of parenthood and literature maybe of motherhood in particular. I just, got done reading a very worthy and thoughtful lit crit book in which almost everything that was being celebrated by this literary critic was revolutionary or subversive or uh, designed to undermine things or, uh, you know, attacks on all that is mm. or uh, visions of destruction. And I think being responsible for young people is a good reminder that rage will only take you so far. That in some ways the revolution is the easy part. Mm. That um, we don't just need to see what is broken we need to figure out how to do better. And sometimes that means building a splint or a life raft mm -hmm. or just figuring out how to make it through the day. And sometimes that means really building something that other people can use that can be shared. Um, creating new habits and new family structures and, you know, dare I say it, new institutions. Mm -hmm. Um 
And that's not just something that we're trying, you know, to live like my kids and, and I, and, you know, their awesome other mom have a lot of challenges still, but we don't, we're not like all by ourselves in the middle of the ocean. Mm -hmm. We have other adults who are there for us and, and there in various ways for our kids. And it's something I'm trying to write about what I, told people about the set of books of poems that I've been writing was that, you know, Belmont was about, Belmont was about a lot of things that weren't working. Um, and Advice from the Lights, which I'm pretty happy with, which is a poetry book that I guess has a few more readers as such things go. Like that's, you know, that's my childhood book and it's my trans coming out book. And it's another book about teens because everything I write has some kind of teen superhero presence in it somewhere, <laughs> um, which we can talk about. But mm -hmm. that's a coming out book, and it's a but it's it's a book that has visions of social life and visions of my own, you know, past and of, of my own identities. But it's not a book that has queer communities really or adult communities. Mm -hmm. And the next. I mean, the most recent book of poetry, it's it's all semi-translations and fake translations, and it's me being guided by what's there in the Greek. The next book of poems that's that's gonna be out, that's not primarily translations, um, is a book about finding community, and in particular queer and trans community, but fan communities also, and parenting communities, and it's a book about finding your people. Mm -hmm. And that's that's also something a lot of us need. Definitely. Um, yeah. And and your your media empire with this podcast is is a small part of that because people yeah, are connecting through it. People. And thank you. Exactly. I'm going to stop talking so you can ask questions because I think no, I'm just questions. like wrapped by <laughs> not a problem. Oh. Um, Lockheed appreciates it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Tell me a little bit more about um, the community of motherhood. And I was talking to. Um, my previous guest last week who was saying that she felt very stifled by the sort of white middle-class mother um, performance. And she mentioned like going to soccer games and feeling the, um, the judgment if she wasn't at every game or clapping on the sidelines. Like if she took her work to the soccer game, she was judged by the other moms. Um, it sounds like you've built a really strong and supportive community of, of other parents. Do you find, are there communities of parents that um, haven't been as supportive or accepting? So I see this a lot. Um, I want to see and acknowledge the pervasive reality and difficulty of the problem your other guests described. It is real, but I haven't seen it. And I haven't seen it for two reasons. One is that that kind of pressure to go to every soccer game to make sure your kid is playing soccer and not to bring your work to the soccer game, that can be felt internally, right? You can mm -hmm. feel that pressure on yourself. That, that's what you grew up thinking being a good mom was that. And don't bring your work to the soccer game. And I haven't felt that as much. And then I think that has to do with being having friends who are very strong professionally oriented moms in the sciences in particular but it also unfortunately has to do with being raised with the expectation that i would excel in a career and have time left over for kids rather than the reverse mm -hmm. because you know the people who raised me didn't know i was a girl mm -hmm. and um trans moms and trans women feel other kinds of pressure to perform femininity and womanhood, especially visually, but the same kind of pressure to, you know, how can you possibly put your career ahead of your kid? You need to have your eye on the ball at all times and your kid is the ball. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't quite grow up with that. Um, It is real and it's bad and it's in a lot of places, but it's not as much inside my head. I felt guilty for pursuing my career, but I did it. Mm -hmm. um, the other sort of thing that I'm seeing about how my experience has been different is that the friend groups we had when our kids were young 
and the friend groups that we've maintained have been by and large groups of strong women who pursued either pretty serious creative endeavors or fairly demanding careers or sometimes both. And a lot of that has to do with the way that you meet other moms and other non-mom parents when your kids are young is often through your childcare arrangements. Mm -hmm. And that means that stay at home moms meet other stay at home moms and uh, assistant professors of chemistry who are taking advantage of 40 hour a week daycare meet other, uh, you know, assistant professors who are taking advantage of that daycare. And the fact that our primary child care provider was on campus Harvard University daycare for most of the time that our kids were that age, either part time or full time, meant that there were women who would bring their work to the soccer games. Mm -hmm. And that made me feel okay about bringing my work to play dates and children's theater and so on. Although when your kid's on stage, you watch the kid. <laughs> but when they're off in rehearsals, you don't watch the empty stage, you you grade papers. Mm -hmm. um, my, you know, my friends were people who were, were doing that, who were moms and sometimes dads. Uh, so we happened to have a, a group that was very academic. And I think that created other problems because it created the sense that for our kids that, oh, you, you know, you you need to be you need to do good in school because that's how you get a job. Mm -hmm. But that's a separate problem from the pressure to be a perfect sideline mom. Also, mm -hmm. neither of our kids had any interest in team sports, um, so the literal soccer problem uh, was they just <laughs> um, the, the like soccer was just not a thing. We tried fencing. And are which I re actually recommend fencing if your kid wants individual physical comp competition mm -hmm. because it stays co ed for a very long time. Mm -hmm. yeah. You don't get uh, the the segregation of kids by imputed gender, yeah. which you know can do a lot of harm. Yeah. And fencing parents, some of them are preppies, but some of them it's very international. I, I like the fencing parent community. Um, oh. And we, we left that community largely because our older kid, who was the one who was the, the fencer, uh, in, he wasn't really suited for an intense sport sport, but because that would have been the one. Uh, but he was very short. He was <laughs> very, very short. And if you are a very high level fencer, there are ways you can use your small size to win as well as lose. But if you're a lower level fencer, uh, it generally happens that if one kid has shorter arms than the other, oh, you no. see where this is going. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so person, this, I can see where that's going. Okay, yeah, the <laughs> soccer sidelines thing, like, it's real. It's real pressure. It's terrible. And it's everywhere. But it didn't hit me. I was always mm -hmm. able to say, I have a lot of homework. Well, a thing that we did see, and this is actually good for me, my older one is is always been quite shy. And when he was smaller and would have play dates, he the parent had to stay for the play date. You couldn't leave. And I learned to bring my work wherever it was going and hang out with other parents. Mm -hmm. And I'd learn about their work. And these would be parents who were, you know, often academics or quasi academics. Yeah. And I could say, let's, I'm, I need to be within 10 feet of my child, my child and your child and their friend who doesn't need a, doesn't need a parent there. Cause it's like the friend has different social skills. They're going to play with Legos. And I'm going to sit here and like grade 20 papers and um, listen to you talk about your particle accelerator. <laughs> That actually sounds really amazing to me. It was Especially great. right now in pandemic times. I'm like, oh, oh tell me about it. No, the, yeah. the one, there were really two moms I really bonded with the most over this stuff. Um, and uh, one is in, in, in tech and the other, and this goes back several years, the other one, um, yeah, I can say this. Uh, she and her partner were both 
faculty in the physical sciences at Harvard and she got tenure and he did not mm. because Harvard can't make a spousal hire to save its life unless the person is already extremely famous. Hmm. And uh, so they both got wonderful jobs in the University of California system uh, where they are really enjoying raising their kids who we miss very much. And a few years after they left New England, uh, she won a MacArthur Genius Grant. Thank you, Harvard for not making special hires yeah. uh, and is, you know, has been on TV. There's an episode of Nova with this amazing mom uh, in which she explains why there is a moon. Oh my gosh. She, she figured out why there's a moon. Um, <laughs> and I really miss those play dates. Oh my gosh. Uh, we miss that kid, but that sounds incredible. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. that's wonderful. Yeah. I'm sorry. I can't explain why there's a moon. Yeah. I was just going to say, like, I kind of need to know now. I have to look it up. I mean, she's, she writes, she's a very good writer, but mostly she, you know, co-authors mm -hmm. papers in, you know, nature on why there's a moon. So That's I can put you in touch. Yeah, please do. Actually, I would really, really love that. Okay. <laughs> please do. Making connections. Yeah. Um, I want to make sure that we leave time. We have a little time left, but um, could you read the poem that you, you prepared for us? I prepared two, a brand yeah. new one. And, two would be uh, great. Even okay, better. Yeah. Yeah, this is so much fun. It's really an honor to. Oh, it's such. I, such I try a lot to do some story. I really, I'm, I'm, I, I hope I'm worth listening to. Oh no, you totally are. Um, and we'll uh, talk again after the the reading, so we'll we can go a little um, over. Okay, that works. Um, so this is one of the poems that I think really worked out pretty well, from near the end of Belmont. Butterfly with parachute. I should say that the, the, the piece of children's art described in the poem is, 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 it really happened. Butterfly with parachute. A real one wouldn't need one, but the one Nathan draws surely does. Four oblongs, the size and color of popsicles. Green apple, toasted coconut, and grape, flanked two per side by billowing valentine hearts in a frame of scotch tape. Alive, it could stay off the floor for a few unaerodynamic minutes, thrown as a paper airplane for one or two more. Very sensibly, therefore, our son gave it something not to keep it apart from the ground forever, but rather to make safe its descent. When we ask that imagination discover the limits of the real world only slowly, maybe this is what we meant. So that's from Belmont, which is, I guess, two books ago. And then I'll read you a brand new one uh, that as, let's see, that's a piece of comics crit. Uh, here we go. Um, you know, if you're a magazine editor and you want this one, get in touch. As of now, it's homeless. It, it will probably be in the next book uh, next year, unless I decide I hate it by then, which happens. And, um, it it comes from taking walks during the pandemic and seeing how trees deal and how we deal. And it comes from being worried about raising a tween and raising a teen and seeing, you know, when they're when they're little, uh, unless they have really serious visible physical health problems, and sometimes even then. Um we are told, oh, they'll be fine, they'll be fine. You know, kids are resilient, kids will get through anything. And that could be true, but as they get older and have to make decisions and try to thrive apart from us, minute to minute or day to day, you, you realize that nothing's guaranteed. That there are a lot of paths to a flourishing adulthood, but also a lot of paths that, that, that may not lead there. Um, and that's scary. This is also a poem that inverts the title of and the plot of one of the most frightening books I've ever read. And if you know the book, you know the book. The Taking Trees. Like poplars, they crack dramatically open when frozen. They burn to renew like the sharp-scented pine. 
They send their asymmetrical spinning seeds into the blackening furrows of open fields, tire grooves, hoof prints, the gradual edges of streams. Like maples, they shade the next generation. Like oaks, they thrive in shade. Unlike us, they give their errant children to each according to their needs. The rootlets hold one another in line. No martyrs, they send us out into scrub to build or gather renewable materials. Daily for almost a century, they say without knowing it's true, we too will do fine. Thank you, Steph. I think it's finished. I think it's finished. <laughs> it's beautiful. Glad you like it. And I loved Thank listening you. to you read. One tries, yeah. Um, I've got some more time if you do. You are yeah. the host. You no, are... let's talk for a few more minutes. Tell me about the poems. Tell me about um, the space between the first one you read and the last one you read. <laughs> ah, I love that question. I mean, they're both kind of, you know, Pais like Morelli say, like, um, pretend landscape, pretend naturalist poems in a way. I love imaginary animals. Uh, I love the way the world looks. I love making things up. I love science information, especially the life sciences, which seems, um, you know, I'm not, I don't really have a green thumb. Um, I don't have the patience or the schedule to be a bird watcher. I don't really... I'm not terribly observant for about real world nature, but I see some things and I like read and reading about them and that all of that is information of various kinds of real trees. That's all true. I'm mm -hmm. um, not answering your question. The first one is a poem about watching a preschooler be awesome. And the second is a poem about watching a tween and being scared. You know, you've given, you've, given these kids so many things and by that age you know what you can't give them and you hope you can get those things from other adults from parents and allo parents and you watch them and you hope they'll be fine and you hope that they'll be able to balance taking for themselves and saying what they need and getting what they need against the kind of giving that you want for adults one of my tests for am I giving too much, am I being a martyr, or am I being generous, is what choice would I want my kids to make when they grow up? Mm -hmm. Do I cancel this event? Do I blow this person off? Do I perform this aversive task? Because it might help someone else. Do I give, you know, do I, what choice do I make? And I really, I don't, I don't know where my own boundaries are. I don't have a sense of how much is too much. And I've written about this in other poems. Um, we are told as, as mothers and as people to just trust your instincts. Just, you know, you'll know when, when, when enough is enough or when something's too much or where, where you belong. I don't know those things. <laughs> I don't either. I have no idea. I know what books I like reading and what music I like listening to and what my favorite comic books are and why I identify with certain fictional characters and who I love and who I care about and who I want to like me and who I want to be good to and who I want to hang out with and uh, you know how much time I want to play tabletop role-playing games, um, which is a lot more than I get. I, I know what I want, but I don't have instincts that tell me where the right boundaries are. Mm -hmm. And so I have to sometimes I have to ask others, which means having people in my life who I trust, which I do. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I have to ask other kinds of questions. And the question, you know, is this, are you being giving or are you being taking? Are you giving too much? Are you taking too much? Mm -hmm. um, one of the questions that I ask that makes it a little easier to answer is what kind of decision would you want your kid to make? Yeah. And that's a poem about looking at a whole bunch of allegorical trees that know when to take and when to give and that support one another with their rootlets and thinking, well, can I have that for myself? Can my kid grow up to be sturdy like those trees, mm -hmm. which are not, of course, the giving tree. <laughs> I hope not. A, a, a book of terror. Yes. 
Yes, it's a wonder that that's still considered like a, a book about a friendship or a, oh, it's so scary. Well, it's, it's a, a book, book about what we're told to do to ourselves as mothers. Yeah, totally. Which is, you know, destroy yourself in the hope that your adult child who is paradigmatically a son will come back and cry over your stump when you're dead. It's really <laughs> scary. It is. It's uh, horrifying. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. But it's, I mean, it's true to the experience of self-abnegation that a lot of us are told makes motherhood. And again, that's the wrong answer. What's the right answer? Mm -hmm. What kind of mother? Oh, I think we lost you for a second. Okay, there yeah. we go. There you are. Um, what kind of mother do you want to be for your kids? Oh, busy, conflicted, resourceful, generous. I want to be a good listener. I want to be someone who sets the right boundaries for those. Are you still there? Are yep. you there? Yeah. I want to be someone yep. who sets the right boundaries for that kid on that day. Mm -hmm. And the right boundaries for one kid on one day are not the right boundaries for another kid on another. I want to be someone who's really good at reading my kids to know what that kid needs on that day. I want to be someone who shares their interests as much as is appropriate and no more so. And I want to be someone who gives them the right amount of space to grow and someone who is able to connect them to, to put them in a space where they'll find friends and they'll find other adults who will help them grow because I know I can't do it all myself and no one can. Yeah. Sounds like a good, great mother. Oh, we have to hang out. Yeah. We have to hang out. I know. Um, I know. We, we, as soon as the pandemic's over, we're close enough that we can hang out. Are we? Are you? Are you in Arlington? In where do you? Do I know where you live? Like, no, I'm in Connecticut. Yeah, I'm in Connecticut. Oh, um, in that. Mystic, I'm so pretty close sorry. to Mystic. We, we did the arts and ideas thing. No, that's yeah. okay. Okay, it's like that. Yeah, arts but I had yeah. been working. Yeah, yeah. No, but then I'd been working at BU for the last eight years before moving to Connecticut. So we would have been very close. Oh, I, the last yeah. time I was in Mystic, it was great. I did a book festival with um, the science fiction writer C.S. E. Cooney. Oh, who wow. Who you may or may not have encountered. Yeah. It was really mm -hmm. fun. Um, oh, yeah. That's I'm, amazing. I'm sorry. I, I did know where you lived. I'm the worst. Oh, no, that's okay. No, I can never remember awesome. people's names or where they live or, or anything. Details okay. like that. <laughs> okay. We still we still have to hang out. Um, yes. Is definitely. there, should we do more or is this, these are yeah, generally let's, about um, an hour Yeah, about an hour. So let's, well, I, I could talk to you all day, but um, I think I'll close with a question I've started asking, um, which okay. is if you had a message for listeners, for writer moms, what would that message be? Oh, I think the message is reach out, right? Yeah. Like, um, you're not as alone as you think you are. And if you are now, you won't be. Um, you deserve supportive friends. And you deserve space and time. And, and your kids deserve allo parents. And, you know, keep reaching out until you find people. And, and if, if you have, if you don't have the energy, if you're just out of spoons all the time, keep reaching out where there might be people who share your interests and share your problems and share your disposition. Um, and if you do have the interest, there's someone, have the energy, there's someone who you can share that energy with yeah. besides your kid. There's, you know, there are rootlets. Don't like, don't self-isolate, which is a hell of a message for the end of the plague, which of course is not over in, in other countries. If, if the plague is ending for you, you're lucky and I'm yeah. unlucky, but like, yeah, you don't, you will, you will be less isolated and you can be less isolated. Um, oh, and also, this is not your fault. Like we had get the more the more self help advice we get, the more we feel if it's not working, we didn't take it. It's like our fault, mm -hmm. and that's no, no, it's not your fault. Thank you, Stephanie. It's, it's patriarchy. <laughs> 
<laughs> that's okay. like the subhead of the the podcast. So we started oh, yeah. right up there. Yeah, yeah, and like we get to think about how to how to build things and make things better. Yeah, and but also your your rage is valid, and like in some you know I'm coming from so much privilege. I know that I'm still part of the problem because I'm implicated in the system that benefits me, even though. I'm also, you know, doing the best I can as a mom. Yeah. And I want to acknowledge that. Yeah. Very quietly, apparently. Sorry if you just turned the volume knob all the way up. <laughs> I think I should let you go. Let's no, do this again. This has been amazing. So Thank you fun. so much. Thank you for staying tuned. If you don't, if, if the, the audience may not know, um, we had to reschedule this a couple times because the first date that we had, I'd just been vaccinated and was literally delusional. <laughs> and then the second date, I wasn't feeling well. So well you're here now. You're so good. You're such a good host. Okay. No, this has been so, okay. such a pleasure. Lockheed and Octavia are going to say bye to you. Okay. 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 <laughs> Next time. Bye. Bye, bye everybody. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us again um, for this episode. And thank you to Stephanie for just a wonderful conversation. Um, as always, hope you'll become a patron or patroness of the podcast and help me keep it going. And check out the classes tab on the website for a, a writer motherhood um, workshop where we will have solidarity, support, and some writing time. So I'd love for you to join me on May 8th for that. And I will see you all next week. Thank you so much for joining us.